Welcome to Cross Border Tax Talks, where we discuss the latest trends in international taxation, from global tax reform to society's most challenging issues. I'm Doug McConey, PwC's U.S. International Tax Services leader. You can find me on Twitter at Exporter Tax. On this week's episode of Cross Border Tax Talks, I'm honored to have Roy Weathers back on the podcast. Roy is the Vice Chair of Policy and Societal Engagement at PwC. Roy is also the CEO of CEO Action for Racial Equity. Prior to taking on those roles in July of 2020, Roy was the firm's U.S. tax leader. Roy, welcome back to the Cross Border Tax Talks podcast. Hey Doug, it's great to be back with you. Thank you for uh, the invite. So on our last podcast, Roy, we were actually talking about tax and we've brought you on here because since you've left me in our tax practice about you know, six or eight months ago, I want to hear about the new gig. Can you tell our listeners what you have been working on since you've uh, left our, our, our tax practice and have been trying to solve some of society's greatest challenges? Yeah, so it's as I said, it's great to be back and never you never lose you never leave tax. <laughs> once you once you're in tax, you never truly leave it. So it's great to be back and uh, I know all is well. So yes, uh, over the last uh, five months, I've been focused on um, CEO action for racial equity and really uh, setting that up with our clients in the corporate community to make change. Uh, from a societal perspective. Uh, I, I, uh, I'll start by just reminding everyone where we started as a firm. PwC started uh, well over four years ago with CEO Action for Diversity and Inclusion. So let me remind you where we started well over four years ago with CEO Action for Diversity and Inclusion. Um, that effort, which is incredibly uh, uh, Put, was incredibly put together and is now well over 1,600 companies, was really focused on helping companies and supporting companies to support each other to drive diversity and inclusion inside their organization. At the time CEO Action for Diversity and, and Inclusion was launched, there were three pledges that the CEO and the company, we call them signatories, had to sign up for in order to be part of the platform. It was to make your workplace safe for discussion and candid conversation, to uh, engage in training, uh, implicit bias training, uh, for example, training on diversity and inclusion, and sharing, sharing amongst the companies. Uh, some of the companies are rather large and some are rather small, but that sharing and collaboration of ideas and best practices was part of the pledge. And so, as I said, that launched well over four years ago. Um, this summer with George Floyd, the George Floyd killing and the uh, unrest that we all saw, uh, a number of those CEOs got together and said, is it time for the corporate community to address societal challenges by addressing public policy? And this is a new area for the corporate community. Uh, policy is not new. Obviously, we focus on policy for our industries and our sectors all the time. But coming together to think about policy, public policy, as it relates to societal changes, um, social injustice, uh, systemic racism was something that the corporate community by and large had just not touched. And so that was the effort. And out of that came CEO action for racial equity. And I was asked uh, by Tim Ryan, our CEO, uh, to lead that up focus on policy and focus on working with the corporate community um, to drive change. And so October 1, we launched this effort. Uh, it is a fellowship. It uh, is really uh, the best of what we all do day in and day out from a corporate perspective and our own uh, sectors and industries coming together, focus on policy. Uh, there's a governing committee of 20 CEOs that I work with. Uh, we have well over 150 companies that have contributed uh, 200 plus fellows. A fellowship is where the individual, the executive comes on to uh, the, the, the platform with us and focus from anywhere from a year to two years uh, across four areas, education, 
health, economic empowerment, and public safety. We do our work through the lens of social justice and the guidance and the principles of social justice, and they're simple. Equity, participation, um, rights, and the respect for one's actions. And so as we think about our work through the lens, it's clear that when you look at the black community, for example, the gaps and the opportunities to improve from a societal perspective is clearly there. And so that's where we start our work. And one of the things that became very obvious to us is when corporate America decides it wants to roll up its sleeve and get involved, things happen. Uh, the Business Roundtable, if you recall, several months ago uh, announced that they, they saw a need for corporate, the corporate community to have an outreach, to have a perspective on stakeholders that are beyond um, just those from a financial perspective, from an investment perspective. And so that was very similar to what gave rise to setting up and establishing and developing CEO Action for Racial Equity. Yeah, so let's let's unpack some of this because this is it's this is really exciting, Roy. The the commitment that I think the larger corporate community has made, and you know, I think what's what's interesting is where we started with the CEO Action for Diversity and Inclusion, which was, and if I'm oversimplifying, please please correct my characterization, but was more focused on the companies kind of looking inward and what can we be doing better for our underrepresented minorities. And you know, something I've been very focused on as I think about our international tax practice is what can I do to 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 help make sure that our black professionals, for example, have can be every bit as, as successful as, as all of our professionals, right? And so it was sort of inward looking to within those members of the CEO Action Diversity for, or excuse me, the CEO Action for Diversity and Inclusion and, and sharing those best practices, which obviously is still very important as we look within each of our own Absolutely. companies and organizations. But what, what I think is really neat about the CEO Action for Racial Equity and Fellowship is it steps beyond that to say, okay, beyond each of our own respective organizations, what can we be doing more broadly from a policy perspective to really try to change how society behaves and acts and you know, doing what we can as an overall corporate community? So, yeah. so maybe just to, to put in that in context, um, you know, what resources have some of the companies that, that are specific to the CEO Action for Racial Equity Fellowship, like what has PwC committed and, you know, what are some of these other firms committed? Tell me a little bit about that because I think it's just fascinating that people are yeah. we're taking people out of businesses, right, and then moving them into this larger policy discussion. Yeah. It was, uh, no, you're absolutely right. And just to, you know, again, put it in perspective, I, I say to the fellows all the time, we're a bit of a startup in the sense that, you know, we launched October 1. Um, the PwC, I would say, seeded the fellowship with 30 fellows. Um, you may or may not know this, but we went broadly across the firm and had well over almost 500 of our employees apply and submit, um, you know, to this process of becoming a fellow, um, we at all levels started off right. I mean, it was it was partners. So we, we have, all levels. We have we have we have four partners uh, out of the thirty, right down to um, second year associates and managers and senior associates and directors and and, uh, and managing directors uh, the like. From the corporate community, it's been equally impressive. So we have lawyers. We have accountants, obviously. We have uh, data scientists. We have economists. There are folks with HR backgrounds. We have individuals who spent time in the government. We have government affairs uh, experience. So the range of experience, and clearly we have diversity experience. So the range of experience is quite expansive. And, and let me describe a little bit around how we think about policy. I think that'll be helpful. So we think about policy in three ways when we think about this work. First of all, policy that's missing. So if you look at it on a federal, state, and city level, policies that support um, a, a more equitable society when it comes to underrepresented minorities, in this case, the black community. Policies that, that, that don't exist that need to exist. That's number one. The second is 
policies that do exist but need to be amplified. I mean, they're, they're great policies, but the impact, the result in the community is not there. And so looking at that, understanding it, researching it, and trying to uh, understand where the amplification can come from. Clearly, there are policies that are counterproductive, policies that have been on the books for many, many years that even on, a, on, on, on any basis, clearly on a bipartisan basis, many would say, well, wait a minute, I'm not sure that that piece of policy is fit for the current times. And then the last category is what we call social contracts. And social contracts essentially are, uh, an, is an alignment around a policy or a strategy that the corporate community agrees that they wanna partake. It's not, it's not a law in, in the traditional sense, a piece of legislation. You don't need a law. What you need is the corporate community saying, we're going to focus on early childhood education. We're going to focus on uh, um, um, black uh, business diversity. We're going to focus on a, an array of things in the healthcare. We're going to focus on how do we help uh, provide uh, primary care support in certain neighborhoods. And that's our social contract piece. So new policy, amplifying existing policy, highlighting policy that's counterproductive, um, and, and then this last category of social contracts. When you think about it like that, the corporate community with the talent that I mentioned, the lawyers, uh, right through to the data scientists, all play a key role in the research that we're doing, uh, the outreach. Uh, we come to this uh, humbly appreciating that this is not our life's work. There have been organizations that have been at this for decades. Um, and we connect with those organizations. There are organizations like Brookings that do deep research that we work with. Um, the, there's a number of bipartisan platforms that we, we work with that have done research in these various areas. And so the, the, you start with the talent, you start with the commitment, uh, the opportunity to make a difference is there, and that's what we're focused on. Yeah, and to make sure that it's clear to our listeners, these professionals that are coming out of their respective organizations, are, this is their full-time job, right? I mean, this is yeah. like, so they, like for the, the PwC folks, they're no longer, they're relieved of, of their client responsibilities, and, and this is a full-time job for them. So yeah. help me understand. Can I just make a comment on that? Just a comment yeah. on that. So, so it, it is their full-time job, but the thing that's unique is, um, it's their full-time job, but we're working, if you're from the PwC lens, you're working with clients and executives from clients just in a different way. And so um, I see competitors and industries now working together. And just, just to frame it a bit, we take these individuals, we put them into small pods of five to six within these four pillars that I mentioned. And so you're working with teams that uh, maybe from P&G or maybe from Pfizer or maybe from uh, HP or, you know, just an array of companies um, that are working in these small pods. So, yes, you're, you're, you're away from the traditional client work, but you're spending every day working with clients just in a different way from the PwC perspective, just to, just to share that. Right. And, and like fundamentally, that's what we do is like we solve complicated problems, right? I, I yeah. spend my days yeah. thinking about complex cross-border tax problems, but fundamentally we're, we're problem solvers, right? I think that's what all of us would say, I mean, frankly, irrespective of what industry you're, you're, you're in. And, and, and so it's very interesting to me, you, you talk about the pods because, you know, I, I spend a lot of time, Roy, doing deals and, and big deal integration. And I think about like, you know, ha, like, how to actually get stuff done. Like, how do you actually create a work plan? This, the way you describe it, it seems so overwhelming, right? And and particularly as we talk about some of the different policies that we want to affect, and some of these policies have been around for, for decades, if not, you know, century or centuries. Um, you, you had started with talking about these pods, right? So tell me a little bit about the process. I mean, okay, so you break people yeah. into pods. You talked about the, the four major kind of categories, economic empowerment, education, healthcare, and public safety. But yeah. how do you start to tackle something like this? You said you start with the five po with the pods, but elaborate yeah. on that for yeah. me. I will just say there are days that uh, I thought, you know, leading the tax practice was challenging, but there are days where it, it really tests uh, all the components of leadership because you have very capable individuals 
the when we look across the the community, the black community, for example, there are so many areas where there are gaps and there are needs for focus, uh, picking, narrowing your focus. Um, as you would imagine, we bring all the talented individuals together. There's a lot of passion there. Um, there's specific areas of interest. There's specific areas of expertise. Um, and so we try to bring all that together in a way that makes sense of our day in and day out work. Clearly, we use technology. So one of the things I didn't say, but is a key uh, tenet of our work is we are data led. So we use a lot of data to help us figure out where are the domino opportunities? Where are the, the areas that if you just focus on these areas in these cities, the follow on impact would be enormous. And so we use data to help us do that. We use technology to help um, our teams as they ideate around policies and ideas. We use platforms um, like the Idea Hub to help assimilate those ideas and organize them. Uh, we use, uh, as you would imagine, uh, talent to help us and technology to help us find each other. So you have individuals from different companies and varying cultures with capabilities and experiences getting to the right person that can help you answer a question is a, is a real challenge and we're using talent uh, uh, technologies that we have to, to that we've used at the firm and other places to actually do that so a bit of it is technology a bit of it is creating standardization around looking at data um, a bit of it is asking the right questions um, we we use voting techniques uh, within the fellowship to make sure that we're hearing the voice of the fellowship as we select or down select, if you will, to ideas that we will go forward with. So just to give you, I could go deeper into this, but that gives you a few of the highlights as to how we actually function and get work done on a day in and day out basis. Yeah, so as, as I think about, you know, in, in my role, again, as, as being informed as an international tax advisor, right? Like, you, you first need to understand what all the facts are, and then you know you have to ideate. You need to brainstorm. We need to think about what are the ways and what are the ways that we can try to efficiently combine these businesses to go back to to, to my deals example. And then you know you have to do a fee, we have to figure out which of those ideas are the feasible are feasible, and then also we have to think about where do you get a return on your investment, right? Are there some ideas that we should spend more time on because they could have a a larger proportional impact? Than, than others. So how do you do that in this type of context? You had mentioned something called the idea hub, um, which it sounds yeah. like is a way to kind of inventory some of those ideas. But uh, how do you prioritize? Because I assume we're still sort of in that phase of ideating and feasibility, um, given relatively how new this is. But t tell me a little bit about that. Yeah. So just as you described, so we use, we, we have a platform and um, the, the fellows within the pods, within the pillars, so those foundation of pillars, go deep into gap analysis in terms of where are the areas for the need. One of the things that we do a lot of is we consult and we connect. So there's a lot that's been written on health in the black community. It's been a lot written on the economic Im uh, uh, impact within the black community. You layer on COVID. So, so our mission is to both be relevant and to prioritize those areas that we believe will get traction. And so one of the things we do often is we do SWATs on what's happening. We now have a new administration. Um, we're very interested in where the corporate community is spending its time and its dollars today in terms of community outreach. And so we, we, we bring a lot of input into the equation, but ultimately uh, we have to decide. We have to decide. We went through an ideation. I'll just give you some order of magnitude, and we came up came up with well over three hundred potential ideas and areas to focus. Uh, we narrowed that down as a fellowship to fifteen. Uh, we're now taking that down to five to eight, and with a goal of uh, some quick wins, uh, actually showing success. And and there's two areas, two superpowers that I talk about often, and and it's very important as we. Think about our work and our focus on prioritization. Those two areas of, of, of that, that represent superpowers. The first is the ability to pull together talent in a way that corporate America has never come together before. Uh, this is a two-year initiative, but what we hope 
is that we're now breaking ground and creating a foundational platform that corporate America can leverage this fellowship to solve global problems going forward. So the ability to actually have talent. And what I say is spend the time doing the work and not raising money or fundraising or some of the other things that organizations have to do. The second superpower is the power of the organizations themselves. So when you look at the companies, the well over 100 companies that have contributed fellows, they employ uh, millions of employees throughout the country. Their impact on our economy is significant. And so when you bring that influence coupled with a desire to improve society in terms of what we're talking about here, it's a very, very powerful equation. And so everything we do as a fellowship is focused on leveraging our fellows and the talent. We care very deeply about the work that our fellows are doing. We spend time on belonging. We spend time on training. Arguably, we bring in the, the deepest experts and all of these areas, health, education, economic empowerment, and public safety across the country. They come, to, they spend time with us uh, in uh, town halls and small lecturing series. So as a fellow, you're not only working on the issue, but you're also improving your own acumen. You're also expanding your own culture dexterity because you're taking that back to your company. Your company will benefit from this, this, this uh, effort that you've been engaged in if you're a fellow. And then as a corporation, look, it's hard to be uh, a, a CEO today and it's hard to be a company with a global brand and not pause and ask, how can you contribute to making society better in the area of race and social justice? You may not want to, but your customer base, your employee base will given social media and all the ways we have to communicate, they will not let you sit on the sidelines. And so this effort is established in many ways so that a particular company doesn't have to go it alone. You can work collaboratively and, can, and candidly, we're getting more done when we work collaboratively. So um, more around how we do it, um, hopefully that's helpful to uh, to the listeners. Yeah, and I, I had the chance to to chat with what with one of the PwC fellows, and and obviously many, if not most, of these fellows don't necessarily have expertise in this particular area of right of social justice, and and so I know one of the things that the this woman who I had spoken with has been particularly fascinated with the the ability to be able to talk to a number of, of, of the experts in this area. And I think that's really been a part of the process, as you had mentioned, whether it's professors or public policy people or government folks, it, it's really that's part of this diligence process that, that, that these people are going through. You had yeah. mentioned going from, you know, using the idea hub and going from 300 ideas to 15 down to, to eight or so. Can you preview or, or maybe share one or two of, of those ideas to, to help, help us understand kind of how you might be framing? I don't know if you want to pick one of the particular pillars. Yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll give you a sense of what's in the 15. Um, so telehealth, I'll just use that one as an example. So you may or may not know that um, in the black community, primary health care is one of the biggest challenges. And so when you don't have um, adequate primary health care facilities, the cost of health for all of us goes through the roof. And so one of the things that happened as a result of COVID is, uh, you know, for example, Medicaid and Medicare um, now covers uh, telehealth. It didn't previously, and it's uh, it's a temporary uh, provision that was put in because the ability to actually get to a doctor uh, physically just wasn't or is still not there, and and within um, you know the confines of the pandemic and, and COVID. Well, what's happened is what the data is showing that having telehealth is actually a very innovative and creative way to deal with lack of primary health care in certain communities. And so what you, what you would start to wonder is, well, wait a minute, if that was a permanent part, if it was permanently covered for our underrepresented, the elderly that are on Medicare, Medicaid, for example, how one efficient 
would it be from a cost perspective? How effective could it be in terms of uh, early prevention and mitigating some of the long-term health issues if that was in place? Sufficient for the doctors, et cetera. Now, there's no idea without challenges, no, there's no idea that is universally loved, but even on a bipartisan basis, telehealth is one of those areas that gets a lot of support. That's an example where we're bringing that under, that's under consideration being evaluated to our signatories to say, look, is this something you could get behind as we try to help find a way to make that permanent? Um, it's using technology, which is much less expensive than brick and mortar. It gets right to the heart of uh, trust and some of the other things, the other challenges in certain communities. And part of our mission, and I'll, I'll quote our mission for you in a few minutes, but the end of it says societal well-being. Having a healthier society is good for business, it's good for this country, um, and telehealth is one of the examples among many that we're looking at. Yeah, so you know, one of the concerns or challenges I can imagine has been how politicized almost I feel like everything is as part of our discussion. Um, so when you think of healthcare, right, you all of a sudden can think of, well, that starts getting politicized, right? Obviously, as we think about race relations and that being politicized, you had mentioned the desire for this to be a bipartisan effort. Has that been a challenge or something that you've seen and, you know, given kind of the, the political state today and, and how do you deal with that or respond to, you know, the, the potential politicization of, of these types of very important issues? At this point in our history, um, politics is everywhere. But here's a simple way that I think about it. So number one, really um, insightful people can agree when you have data and you have insight that highlights certain things. So you start there. And I, I start with, you know, most people are well-intended. You may not be informed, but you're, you're well-intended. So one of the things we try to do is stick to the facts, right? We, we try to stick to the data of outcomes and results. That's number one. The second component is there are many areas where people agree that something needs to be done. Now, the challenge is how do you actually do it? And that's when the, the divide starts to happen. But I have been incredibly encouraged and part of, our, part of our mission is to find those areas where there is agreement, but something needs to be done. There's still, uh, the action is lacking. And so fortunately, there are a lot of those areas. You look at opportunity zones, for example, and this is, you know, take us back to our tax a bit, right? Opportunity zones are something that have been supported uh, on a bipartisan basis, but arguably there needs to be more research. I mean, part of our what we're looking at is how do you actually uh, establish more uh, insight and data from the impacts of opportunity zones. But clearly in certain parts of the country, and it's a great collaboration between federal and state, the areas have been identified, but clearly with opportunity zones, there's a, there, there is an opportunity to continue to have a greater impact. It's great for the investors, it's great for the community, but there's a gap there. And so uh, bipartisan support, but we have to roll up our sleeves and figure out how do we make what already exists and has existed for some time more effective. Yeah, I love focusing on what we have in common. I think that's a, a great way to, to, to state it. And, um, you know, as I, as I think about my colleagues, partners, and friends that I have on, on both sides of the aisle, right, it's, it's our common, you know, human characteristics that make us friends, right, not necessarily our political leanings. And so it's a very worthwhile effort. Um, you know, Roy, we had the chance to work closely together during the two years um, that our roles overlapped when you were the U.S. tax leader and I was the international tax leader. One thing that I'm mindful of in all of our interactions is that I never acknowledged or asked you about your experiences as a black professional. Can you share a little bit about what your experience has been as a black tax professional throughout your career and how has that really informed, you know, this, this role that you're now taking over? 
Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a great question, Doug. And um, there have been moments when I've had to pause and reflect on that. Um, as you would imagine, you know, being an accountant, getting into this business, um, trying to make my way through tax. Um, I had a lot of support and sponsorship from a lot of people who didn't look like me. Um, and I was very appreciative of that and, and, and took note of that. Um, I think the biggest thing for me coming up through the firm is the notion of belonging. So um, it's, a, it's a simple concept. When you're um, in an environment that you're used to or you're comfortable with, other people um, either uh, could be your family members or you went to school with or they look like you or you're, you're connected to in some natural fluid way, um, there's a level of comfort that you have whether you know it or not. And I think uh, as the firm has become more diverse, and we clearly have over the years, I've appreciated as we've become more diverse, what that means to a black uh, professional or a Latino professional that may look around and not see a lot of people who look like them. And so for me, this notion of, of extending and being uh, very thoughtful and encouraging about belonging has been a really key factor. And fortunately for me, I had a lot of mentors and sponsors over the years who did just that. So that's probably the biggest key. Um, and one of the things that I've tried to do and I try to do every day is not take for granted that people feel as if they belong. They may feel capable, they may feel competent, um, they may be performing at a high level, but let's not take for granted that everyone in the room feels as if they belong in the room. And so that's probably the big thing that I would highlight. Yeah, those are great pieces of advice. And I, I've gotten a number of questions, particularly after the, the podcast that, that I had where Stephen Bosha came on to talk about you know, similar issues is the, the importance for, for mentorship and sponsorship. And I think that you know, making sure that people understand that it's something that I've studied and, and, and spent a lot of time thinking about, about what I can do in my role to be a better mentor and sponsor. And so it's great to hear and not surprising that you had those individuals throughout throughout your career and then not taking for granted that that belongingness and, and making sure that people feel a part of the team, of the community, of the group is is really important. So maybe my last question for you, Roy, is, I feel like we have really great momentum in this area of, of social justice and particular focus amongst the, the black members of our community and, and what we can do to, to help. And, um, you know, I, I stated on my, on the podcast with, with Stephen Moshe, I, I it, the, that the video of George Floyd shook me to the core. Right. And, and I think, uh, um, you know, it really started this this movement. And of course, it's not just limited to George Floyd, as we think about Brianna Taylor, um, you know, St. Louis, my my hometown has had its you know own set of issues. And we think about Michael Brown. Uh, how do we keep this momentum? I, I feel like, you know, and, and you've articulated in the past that things feel a little bit different this time. Right. And we're really trying to, to, to make change. And certainly the individuals that we have that we have been dedicated throughout the corporate America and this fellowship is, is, is outstanding. But how do we keep the momentum and really get to that next point where we're actually implementing and, and, and causing and creating that change? I, I do think that this time feels different. Um, and, and Doug, you know, in many ways, you know, when we spent our time here today talking about um, CEO for racial equity and corporate community, but in many ways, the reason I am incredibly encouraged and optimistic is it is the millions of citizens every day that's a bit more conscious of the impact they're having, a bit more conscious of that notion of creating a belonging environment, a bit more conscious of wanting to continue to improve society. I say often this is the best country in the world with the challenges that we have. I can't think of any other place I'd want to live and be. But with that said, we are all part of perfecting it. We're all part of continuing to improve it. And so what I see that's the most encouraging are individuals everywhere in little ways and in big ways 
taking it upon themselves to be more thoughtful. You know, I talk about cultural dexterity, uh, people being more curious about each other. And the thing that I know is once you start to go down that road about being more curious, being more open, uh, challenging the way you've always thought about certain things, um, it's a fulfilling feeling. And it is something that I see and I hear as I talk to many, whether it's CEOs or uh, experts in a particular area or just, you know, the, the average person on the street that's engaged. Like, it feels like we care about continuing to improve this great country that we have. And that's what's different. And that's what's going to make a difference. And um, generations to come will benefit from from the kinds of things that we're working on and focus on today. So that's where my encouragement comes from. I'm hugely optimistic. Um, we're gonna continue to do the great work together and society will be a better place for it, which is great to live in, great to work in, and um, the envy of many as we continue to, 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 to work on these areas. Well, I share your optimism, Roy, and I look forward to having you back on the podcast in the near future to, to hear about those, those ideas and how they're progressing forward. So thanks for coming on today. Yeah. Thank you. Happy to come back anytime. Keep up the good work. So thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of Cross Border Tax Talks. Thanks again to Roy Weathers, PwC's Vice Chair of Policy and Societal Engagement. I'm Doug McConey, PwC's International Tax Services Leader. Stay tuned in two weeks for another exciting edition of the Cross Border Tax Talks podcast. This podcast is brought to you by PwC, all rights reserved. PwC refers to the U.S. member firm or one of its subsidiaries or affiliates and may sometimes refer to the PwC network. Each member firm is a separate legal entity. Please see www.pwc.com slash structure for further details. This podcast is for general information purposes only and should not be used as a substitute for consultation with professional advisors.